We have Steve. He's from Wellington. He does open stack things and he likes printing gibbons. Let's make him feel welcome. <laughs> Um, hi. So a, a while ago, I, I managed to justify to, uh, buying a 3D printer for for the household, um, and it's, it's yeah. <laughs> and what's more, I actually occasionally use it, and I even more occasionally make something that's actually useful and works. Um, but what what turned out to happen um, as as I. Uh, worked out my process for, for uh, designing and printing things is that it turned out that my entire tool chain ended up being uh, backed by Python based tools. Um, so I thought I should probably do a talk about it. So, who are these uh, 3D uh, consumer printers aimed at? Um, there was a time when uh, the, the answer to that was everybody. Um, at least, if not now, then really, really soon. And, you know, this brand new printer, that's, that's for everybody. Um, it hasn't worked out that way so much. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, and uh, I'm going to go through a few of them. Um, but a as I go on, I, I, you know, I'm going to say why this isn't necessarily a bad thing, at least not yet. Um, so the promise of 3D printers is, am is, is amazing. You know, the, it, we immediately go to science fiction things and uh, you know, think of you know, things like the Star Trek replicator. It will give you anything. Um, no, consumer 3D printers do not do this. So, okay, so let's lower our expectations a little bit. Uh, it's a convenience appliance with uh, all the other appliances in your kitchen, which you can use to um, you know, make useful things around the house. No, it is not a convenience appliance. Um, maybe it will be soon, but it's, it's certainly not now. So expectations are lowering. And um, it's even made it onto the, onto the uh, Gartner hype cycle, you know. It's Gartner, but um, I put this on because it's, it's amusing. Um, see, the uh, consumer 3D printing is on a uh, gravity-assisted trip into the uh, trough of disillusionment. But that's OK, because now is a really good time to uh, think about the tooling um, that, that you use to, um, to feed into the design process of, of um, objects that end up getting printed on these things. And by the time they... Uh, uh, um, Expectations are, are, are more realistic with the um, with the actual abilities of the devices. Um, we'll be in a much better position to, um, to 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 make the most of them. So, what's left if we take out the everybody? Um, we have three general areas where these where these devices are, are working really well. One is education. Uh, one is uh, sort of product prototyping in a commercial environment, and another one would be the home enthusiast. So these are my kids. One of the justifications for getting the printer was that they could uh, learn 3D design and print things themselves. Mission accomplished. <laughs> they can do what they like now. <laughs> um, but they actually did a big thing. Um, these were designed on um, a website called Tinkercad. Um, it's a really good tool, um, considering there's, a, there's not a lot of easy to use open source uh, 3D design visual tools. Um, Tinkercad, you know, it, it's at least a, a software as a service, and it, it, it gives you a way of, you know, building some primitive shapes into something complex and useful. Um, and it's good for kids. Um, to be fair, the, the the dragon had a little bit of assistance from me. Um, and the ice creams, I whenever I buy a new color, I am obliged to print out a new cone and a new top for the ice cream in that color, so that she can add to her collection. Um, but yeah, education environments, it's, at, at a stretch, I'd say from primary onwards, you know, all the way to ter tertiary, um, it's, it's a great experience for, for, for students to um, have, be able to design something and, and go through the entire process into you know, making a real thing. Um, you, you do have to be careful. Um, if you're setting up a lab, um, you need to have the teaching or the admin resource to actually run it. Um, these things are not zero effort. <laughs> Again, product prototyping. If you've got people that are being paid to do it, they will learn how to do it. Um, this is a, um, a ring that I printed for a friend who's a professional jeweler. Um, he, he needed a, a, a 3D print of a design um, to show the client, um, and if the client approved it, he'd get the work. Um, he got the work, um, and I got paid in beer, so that was 
it was fine. <laughs> and finally, we've got the home enthusiast. Um, yes, I'm, I'm making useful things and actually uh, using them. Here's the, the old pot lids that have the handle broken off, so there was this tiny little nubbin to lift off this really heavy glass lid. So to have um, knobs back on my pot lids is, is wonderful. So, so what, what do these three things have in common? Um, what they have in common is that there is a person or persons who have dedicated time to learn how to do this stuff. Why do you need time? Why can't you just put in a design, print it, and use it? Let's find out. <laughs> Printing issues. Um, this was the very first thing I tried to print. And, and I, I knew it would probably fail because, uh, you know, I, I, I had read up enough that, you know, something was going to go wrong. And in this case, it was bed adhesion. Um, the print would start fine, um, but then the part would start cooling down, curling up, and then it's moving, and then it's all over. Um, I eventually uh, solved that by um, coming up with an adhesion method that worked for me, which in my case was a mixture of acetone and ABS plastic which is, uh, becomes a slurry that you can paint onto the bed surface, um, and then it, anything that gets printed on it sticks pretty well. What happened here? Uh, this was an extruder jam. Um, it stopped printing after a while, because if the plastic can't go through the nozzle, then nothing, not much is going to happen. Um, the fix there was to um, take the, the extruder nozzle apart and soak it in acetone, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I don't even know what happened here. <laughs> No, actually I do. Um, so what I, this was a, a, a knob. I wanted it to be quite solid because it's going to be used a lot. Um, so this was another bed adhesion issue. Um, in this case, uh, the thermal stress of this solid lump of plastic, um, as it cools down, it contracts. So it lifts up at the edges, and, and it gets to a point where it starts moving around. And then I wasn't watching the printer at the time, so things happened, and it went all wrong. It, I couldn't get this part to print, so I tried switching to a different color in exactly the same kind of plastic, and it worked. So, yeah, that was a little frustrating. Ah, now this is an interesting one. Um, this is an example of learning how to new, use a new material. Uh, this is Petchy, um, which is, you know, n not as often heard about in uh, 3D printing, but it's... Uh, has some really nice properties. It's much stronger than the old ABS and the and the um, and the, what the other one. Um, it's uh, stable in UV. It doesn't break down in UV light. Um, it's strong and flexible, um, and it's it's food safe. I use food safe in, in air quotes because um, 3D printed things aren't necessarily uh, watertight. Um, so if, if food gets in there, bacteria will grow and, and you'll die of something horrible. But, but the plastic itself is food safe. So I was really motivated to make this work. And it turns out what the issue was, um, PETG is, is really kind of sticky. And there was, uh, as, as it printed, as it changed direction, it would leave little, little hairs of, of plastic poking up. And then as the uh, extruder came around again, it would collect those hairs and it would stick to the side of the hot extruder. And over time, you'd get these bits of plastic building up until there was this great big glob of snot just hanging there. Um, and then it would fall off and it would all turn to poo. And I tried lots of things to try and solve this. Um, I tried uh, changing the temperature. I tried ex changing the, um, the extrusion multiplier. But it turned out the thing that worked best was just slowing the print down by about 20%. Slowing it down, there was no dull hairs coming off, and it printed perfectly. Um, which is really good, because I think I'll be using PETG for most of my prints from now on. And even once you get a successful print, um, <coughs> the, the result will not necessarily performance function for its entire life. Um, you know, a common problem is that uh, you get delaminations on the XY plane, because that's, that's the, the order that it's... Uh, getting extruded in. Um, so, you know, that's fine. It's, it's just a, uh, an attribute of the material. So, I mean, th these sorts of problems, they're just, they're just time consuming. And you have to go through a learning process to, um, to be able to debug these sort of problems. And that's why it takes time. And that's why the audience is a lot smaller than everybody. Because not everybody 
has the time to do this. So let's show some actual useful things. Look, there's a knob that's the wrong color, but um, it works, it's really nice. Um, and then we've got a bracket. So, you know, one, one thing about, um, oh no, I'll, I'll cover that later. So yeah, I'll just, uh, here's, here's the bottom of this, of this gate mechanism. Yeah, so if you see that wedge there, um, it, it starts off as basically nothing and then it wedges up and then it drops down. So, the, so it's, a, it's a locking mechanism. And I knew I, that uh, this wedge probably wouldn't stay flush on the deck. It would start lifting up, lifting up. And that's exactly what happened. Um, but once you have your own printer and you get into this mindset that, okay, this will do for now, it'll probably fail in some way, but I'll wait for the failure and then I'll go back and, and, uh, and do whatever's necessary to, to iterate the design. Um, here's the thing I showed earlier. It's a, um, a, a clip that lets me um, put the vacuum cleaner hose onto the vacuum. The, the old one broke. Um, this one has a lot of leverage on it, so it does, it does break quite often. But this is the sort of thing I'd quite happily print again and again because it, it performs something useful until it breaks. Um, and, you know, the original one broke anyway, so I'm no, no worse off than I was. And, and it's extending the useful life of our vacuum cleaner. So um, let's make an actual useful thing. And this is one of those stereos that the internet says is, uh, you know, sounds really amazing for really not much money. So I got one of them, and it's perfectly fine as a kitchen stereo. Um, but it's, it, I'm not happy with how it's mounted. Um, it's upside down, obviously, because that's the only way I could get the adhesive Velcro to stick. Um, so I'd, I'd like it to be the right way around, um, and I'd like to screw it to the underside of, um, of our bench there. So here's the basic process of making a thing. First, you need to design it. Um, and that will give you a 3D model that's just like any other 3D model. Then you need to transform that model into a list of instructions that a 3D printer can consume. So that's called slicing. Um, finally, you need to print it, and then you can use it. Great, done. And the, uh, the tools that we're going to use in this particular case, um, let's start with OpenSCAD. OpenSCAD is a domain-specific functional language for solid modeling. It's very cool. Um, and I'll, 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 sh I'll show you some examples uh, very soon. Um, solid Python is um, a library which lets you write in Python and generate uh, OpenSCAD uh, files. So what I'll be demonstrating is designing using Solid Python rather than a, a visual tool. Um, for slicing, um, we're going to have a look at Cura, which is the uh, uh, slicing engine with an associated user interface. Um, the engine itself is written in C++. Uh, the user interface is written in Python. And BotQ, um, I know it's in the abstract, but I'm not actually going to show much about BotQ because I don't use it. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a print queue for 3D printers. So if you have lots of them, or um, if you're you know, sharing your 3D printer with a bunch of people, um, then it, it could be a good way of, of, uh, of, of managing print jobs. Um, there's a couple of reasons I don't use it. It doesn't add much value to me. I need to be standing there in front of the printer for the start of the print anyway. Um, also, the printer I have, it's a MakerBot 2 clone. Um, it doesn't consume G-code directly. Um, it has a, requires the G-code to be transformed into a binary form. So. Um, so BotQ doesn't have very good support for that at the moment. Um, OK, so this is a bit more realistic uh, flow of uh, printing. And this is why you know, it, it needs someone who has the time to put in. Yeah, this, is, this is a convenience appliance. This is a time-consuming hobby. <laughs> um, but that's okay, and actually, when you look at it, that's that's virtually identical to the uh, to the flow for writing software, and we're all, you know, prepared to put up with the process for doing that. So it's really just transferring your tolerance for failure and ability to learn to a new domain. Um, so we're going to design this thing, this bracket for the stereo. Um, 
the first thing you need to decide is how are we going to model that in, uh, in, in this solid modeling environment. Um, constructive solid geometry is, is the first broad technique that we can use. Um, it lets you define um, primitive shapes, cuboids, spheres, cylinders, cones, um, and uh, perform operations on them, um, you know, ad, uh, intersections, difference, union. So the top we've got the, uh, the solid Python version. Um, you know, we've got a simple cube, sphere, a cylinder for the hole, and a cylinder for the rod. Um, and we, and um, the operator's um, asterisk has, has been overridden to perform an intersection function. Um, minus has been overridden to perform a difference and a rod performs a union. So if you compare this Python with, um, with this open SCAD that it generates, um, no, the, the Python's quite nice, and I'd be more than happy to, um, to uh, define my things in, in, in the Python version. In addition, you get all the advantages of you know, being in Python. You can, um, you know, you've got dicks, you can slice your lists, you can um, you know, do functions which um, you know, iterate and whatnot. And recurse. So it's for, for yeah for me it, it, it works really well and I you know I, I think I've pretty much settled on using solid Python for for all of my design purposes. So apart from constructive solid geometry, another option is defining a two D shape and then extruding that somehow. Um, you can either do a rotational extrusion extrusion or a linear extrusion stretching it out. This is actually a working garden hose fitting, um, which I've printed and used in anger. So it's another useful thing. Um, but you can see here I'm defining a polygon, a bunch of x, y points, um, and then just doing a rotational extrusion. extrusion. Um, apart from those two um, low level techniques, there's, there's some higher order uh, operations which can come in quite useful. Uh, like the Minkowski sum. Um, uh, I need to skip on here. Convex hull like creates a skin over the objects that you define. Okay, so let's get into seeing what we've got here. So I'm going to make a bracket. Um, it's, gonna, it's basically going to be a cube, cuboid, um, and then with a, a bunch of elements uh, subtracted from that cuboid to give me the final shape. Um, so there's going to be a a, um, a slot for for where those uh, for where that mounting um, bar goes through. Um, I need to round off the slot because there's a fillet that might get in the way. Um, I've got a screw hole, which is a big hole for the for the entire screw to go up, and then a small hole for the um, for the thread to go through. I need two of those holes in different places. Um, we've got these convenience functions to to move them around, so I'm moving it right and a, another extra wee slot for some wires to pass through. And so the final object is the body minus all the things that we don't want. So um, this final, no, this comple it's a completely linear, linear script. There's, there's, there's no um, branching or um, looping at all. So if I execute this Python, if I execute this. OK, so this has generated a SCAD file. Let's have a look at it. Okay, let's just do, 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 do. Look, I've got a thing. Um, so we'll just quickly look at the. So here we've got here's the actual cube, and we've got the difference of 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 all the things we're taking away. So that's fine. So let's let's generate uh, the actual 3D model for this. Um, uh, I've got a make job to do this on a space dot STL. So this invokes the uh, open SCAD environment um, to actually generate the, the 3D model file. So now we've got we've completed the design phase. So let's bring up the um, the slice uh, um, OK, 
Okay, so here we have a printing bed. So I can arrange things. That's, it's not going to print like that, so I'm going to select it and lie it down flat. Um, so I don't, I don't need any um, scaffolding to, to stop things from collapsing. Um, there's all the options you need. There is a, a, a quick print mode, which has a at least minor chance of actually creating something that will just print. Um, but you know, generally, as you as you get to know it, you, you, you'll want to change the the, the options um, based on you know all of the factors that you will learn with time. Um, and in, and in this case, um, I'm also uh, got a little bit of Python to extend it um, because my printer needs uh, compiled G-code. Um, I I will be um, running this GPX thing. So let's just have, have a quick look at the GPX scripts. There's weeks. Mm. So all it's doing is it's uh, grabbing the, the um, generated uh, G code out of uh, Cura properties, um, running it against uh, GPX binary, and then and then saving it. And then if I've got my SD card plugged in, then I can also um, um, it'll also automatically get copied to it, so I can just trot it down to the printer. So, and the end result is done, and it works. I'm quite happy with it. Um, so, there's one thing missing from this flow, and that is, once I've, once I've done it, I should really share it, because this is all about open source. So, Thingiverse is a, is a great website. Um, it's, you know, it's the internet of useful things, so they say. Um, in reality, it's, it's often more like the internet of things that aren't really completely useless. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean that in a nice way. Um, but re recently, they, they added a feature where you can actually upload OpenSCAD files. You don't have to uh, upload the compiled 3D model artifact, um, which, is, which is good. But the really good thing is that you can define variables in your OpenSCAD files, and they will be presented in a user interface that you can customize. So when, when I got into, when I started thinking about 3D printing, this to me was the thing which makes 3D printers much more useful to consumers. Um, if you can customize a thing, you know, everyone's a different shape, um, the, the situations that things are going into um, require tweaks, so, you know, that's, that, this is something that's, that's much more compelling than uh, being able to print a static thing which could be just as easily mass-produced. Um, so if you see this up, up open and customizer here, so if we pop back, I'm running out of time, but if we um, pop back and look at the, um, the generated G code from this, so I defined a bunch of um, bunch of variables. And I want them to be, for some of them, to, to be in my OpenSCAD file. But they won't come through because um, it's, it's been uh, evaluated in Python. All I've, all I've got is the, the final operations. So crap, you know, I'm so close. I've, I've almost got my uh, perfect uh, development environment for designing the things, and I can almost um, offer these parametric files for other people to customize. So, bugger. Um, so I've modified solid Python. I haven't proposed it upstream, so I have no idea um, if it will be accepted, um, but um, I've, I've created this, uh, this variables where you can uh, define some variables, um, give some comment annotations, which is used by uh, Thingiverse to, um, to build the, the, the UI. Um, and then you can just um, use them as you did before. And the result is Customizable part. Um, in this case, all you can customize is um, the screw holes because you know you, you don't mount it with the screws you want. You mount it with the screws you have. Um, so this this way, at least you know you won't have screws poking up through the bench or um, you know things splitting or whatever. Um, so when you end up designing a thing, please consider using Solid Python or OpenSCAD. Um, share it on GitHub and Thingiverse. Thingiverse 
There's a lot of forking, but there's no merging. But it's not Thingiverse's fault. It's the nature of the design tools. Um, um, but if, if the design tool is a text editor, then we can use all those tools that, that we, we can have used the entire flow that we already use to, um, to, to you know, collaborate on, a, on a, a common design. And finally, please consider defining parameters to allow others, others to customize your thing. Any questions? Questions? So um, this is more about 3D printing than about the tool chain. But yeah. um, so uh, a couple of different things. First, you mentioned you know that you use this plastic and that plastic, and um, I, I was just curious to know whenever I've very few occasions I've I've actually been able to touch something that's come out of a 3D printer. Um, it, it's got a sort of sense of it, the plastic is relatively low in density, so it mm. feels quite light. I, is, it, is there any likelihood in the future that a 3D printer will be producing something that is a little more bulky feeling? I, is, is, is the feedstock um, ever likely to be something that will then be some, something a bit heavier? Yeah, the, the reason it feels that way is likely because it's mostly hollow. Um, there's there's, oh, there's okay. no point printing a solid lump of plastic, and you know, with the thermal effect of things shrinking, you, you actually don't want to do that. You want to use the bend in the number of plastic for it to be strong enough to perform its function. Yeah. Um, so, and, and by default, the you know the settings on Cura, for example, is that it's only 25% plastic on the inside. So okay. you can always ramp up ramp up that value to 100 if you want so a solid thing. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. And uh, the other thing was, um, we had a little picture of your 3D printer uh, w in amongst your coffee machine taster. What what is that, and would you recommend it? This is a Flash Forge Creator Pro. It's one of the MakerBot 2 clones. It's an American company. Um, it's manufactured in China, and you buy directly from a Chinese supplier um, on Alibaba or something. Um, it's 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 like a, a good combination of really cheap. I probably landed it for about eighteen hundred dollars, and it's a solid, dependable printer. It's you know got a steel chassis. It's got um, two extruders, um, and uh, and in any every practical sense, it's just like any other MakerBot too. So, if you're looking for something cheap and reliable, I would recommend it. Um, while someone's thinking of a question. Um, uh, I saw a feature recently land in Git for solid Python for um, IPython notebook support. So I, I had a wee crack, and it actually worked. Um, it's not in a released version on pip yet, but um, but you can also um, do uh, solid Python snippets and actually render them to uh, to a, a preview image uh, in your notebook, which is very cool. Um, did I see that that example that you had used eight meters of? Plastic was it? And I was just curious about, about how much is that worth? Um, yeah, I I buy my plastic by the usually by weight. Um, you know, so about um, you know a kilo of plastic is, is hundreds of meters, I think. Um, yeah, so eight meters is, is nothing. Um, you know, it's it, it's frustrating when a print fails, um, but but really all you've, all you've lost is is print time and a little bit of uh, consumable. So you, know, you have to. It, it, it feels like compiling software, really. It's just a really quite a long compile time. <laughs> we have time for one or two more. Going once. Hi. Um, is the Thingiverse, is that strictly sort of for 3D printing, or is it, can you also put in designs on that that might be more suitable to... to for something that you build out of like wood or steel or, or that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I don't think it's limited to 3D printing. Um, there's like you know, laser cut uh, designs. Um, I, I don't know about things that are entirely handmade, but you know, anything that, that is a design file um, could, could be downloaded and had using whatever technique you like, yeah. One last question, anyone? Oh, yes, okay. So Thingiverse is now accepting open SCAD files. Yeah. Do you think you, they might get a bit more meta and just take the solid Python with its um, parameters? Or is there a, any accepted kind of common well, you know, text-based Well, settling on open thing? SCAD wouldn't, wouldn't be terrible. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a functional language, so and it's, it's probably a bit easier to um, contain and execute on the server um, than uh, something of more general purpose like Python. So, you know, as a, as a compiled artifact, I, I think you know, OpenSCAD does a lot. It, it doesn't do everything. Um, you, you can extend it quite a lot to to, to do more. Um, but you know, layering tools on top of that isn't a, isn't a terrible approach. I think, yeah. Yeah, so you can um, in Thingiverse you have a you can have a whole um, you know, description metadata of, of your of your things. So you can include links back to the source code and encourage people to to collaborate re there. Um, yeah. Pull requests, welcome. All right, that's all the time we have. Let's thank Steve again. Thank you.